I want to talk for the next couple of weeks. <laughs> straight. <laughs> no breaks. It's gonna live stream. It's gonna be a it's gonna be a preach a thon. We're going all through the night. I want to talk about that. It's probably going to spill over into a few weeks, maybe. Um, I want to talk about our own, about evangelism. I want to talk about discipleship. Um, and I think I want to talk, well, I know I want to talk about the way that I believe it's supposed to happen and why I don't believe it's happening in the way that it should be. And I'll, I'll clarify that by saying this. Um, how many of you guys have been in church and they, you've heard that there's a discipleship class and they're going to teach you how to be a disciple. So you're going to go to a 10 week class or a four week class and so on and so forth. You're going to learn how to be, when you, when you get done with this, you're going to get a gold star and you're going to be a discipler. You will be ready to disciple another human being into the ways of Christianity. Uh, I have, how many of you guys have seen that work? You've seen, oh, you, you, how many of you guys have seen like, you know, dozens of people go through and then all of a sudden they go out into the world and now they're just discipling people and evangelizing and people are coming to Christ as a result of that. I've been through many of those classes. I've been through many of those classes also. When I started pastoring, I started having conversations and to be honest, uh, it's one of the it's one of the things that we don't talk about often in churches uh, is how poorly we do at discipleship, evangelism, and discipleship. Uh, and I believe it's because uh, we don't know how to do it <laughs> because uh, I believe we're doing it wrong, and uh, I think we're doing it wrong because I don't like I just alluded to. I don't believe it's a class you can take. And we're going to talk about the heart of it this week, the evangelism heart, because that's where the heart of discipleship is. It's in evangelism, is that we care about another human being and our God so much so that we want to share the relationship that we have, this good relationship with our good, good father. We want to share that with another human being because we believe that this other human being would also enjoy a relationship with their heavenly father, that it would fill a void in their life, that uh, they might come to know uh, more about their purpose and their destiny and why they belong and they would fit, you know, their fit in the kingdom and all of those things. So evangelism is the heart behind discipleship. Discipleship is the work. Like a, the reason Janie and I have chosen to do the hard work of raising children and Daniel and Mandy is because we love our children, right? Same thing with you. You love your daughter and you love her. And because of that love that we have for these human beings, we want to help them become more full and live a more robust life. And that should be the same thing that we have when it comes to Christianity is that now that our eyes have been opened and our hearts have been connected to the fathers, we want others out of a heart of love to experience God the way that we've experienced God. Now the work, the discipleship part that we'll get to later, that's, that's difficult. There's a lot of things in scripture that you need to uh, understand, right? And we'll talk about that some today, but there's a lot, I mean, the first time you pick up a Bible, just because you picked it up and you opened it and started reading it, do you know it? How many of you guys have read the Bible through multiple times and you still read things that you're like, did I read that the last time I read the Bible? Because I don't remember that part of the story or I don't remember it going that way or I don't remember it saying that. It really jumps out and strikes you, you know, like, wow, the Holy Spirit is revealing something new to you. Every time I read the scripture, I kind of see a different facet of it. And the reality is that you and I and we get to share those things, those things we've learned, those lessons with other people because of the heart that we have for them because we know that their life could also be better uh, with Christ because we do believe, and this is a faith position, but it's also an experiential position for you and I. We believe that in faith, 
God, if we have relationship with God, we have a better life. It's a life more abundant. I have to take that first step in faith, but then I've also been able to experience our good, good father. So it's not a faith journey for me anymore to say that I believe somebody will have a better life with Christ. It's, it comes from a heart of experience because I've experienced it over decades of my life. So we're going to talk about evangelism today. Evangelism is the spreading of the Christian gospel by public preaching or personal witness. I believe personal witness is the greatest way to evangelize somebody. I know a lot of people who have done a lot of public preaching, and then there's studies that go on. I mean, um, how many of you guys have ever been to Harvest Crusade? I think everybody in Southern California has been to Harvest Crusade, right? Great glory their church and that organization puts on a great event at the uh, at Angel Stadium. That's where it is, Angel Stadium, right? I think it's at Angel Stadium. Yeah. They put on a great event at Angel Stadium. Um, the denomination I grew up in, the Assemblies of God, I believe it was in the 1990s, 1990 to 2000, was called the Decade of Harvest. And the idea was that we were going to be all about evangelism and reaching people in that 10-year period. And I saw, I read statistics at the end of that, something like 200 and some thousand people uh, as a result of the ministries of the Assemblies of God had uh, given their lives to Christ. But at the end of that decade, they could find something like no more than 300 of those people worshiping in churches out of 200,000 something like 300 some odd people were worshiping in churches that uh, they had spent this whole decade trying to reach people. They did it through big events and, and conventions and things like that. Evangelism, again, is the spreading of Christian gospel by public preaching and personal witness. And it's my belief that personal witness is the greatest thing. And here's the reality, guys, if we want to think about it. Uh, I think these are the weird things that I think about laying on my pillow at night. I was having a conversation with my friend Joel from Radiant Church down the street on Spring Springdale. We we're having this conversation, and these things just rack. They just rack my brain. If if you knew that there were, you know, tens of millions of Christians, and each Christian person had three or five friends. And they would personally witness to their three or five friends and take a position that they care for them and want them to meet Jesus. Personal evangelism has the potential to reach everybody in this country in a generation, in just one generation. That's why I say... Evangelism is the Christian gospel being spread by public preaching and personal witness. I believe the personal witness is the most effective way. Part of the reason is that you care. Don't you care about the people in your life? I look at Melissa. I love that she lives in an apartment complex because she has people coming to her all the time and she's like the the little uh, welcome wagon of her apartment complex you know somebody new comes in guess what they get melissa in their face you know hey what's going on you need anything can i help with something you know and, and that's that is the heart of the gospel that's what if if we're going to ask if we're going to be honest look at me for a second if we're going to be honest if jesus lived in an apartment complex i think he'd look a whole lot like melissa am i right Right? right? Do we think Jesus would just stay in his room or in his, in his, uh, in his apartment watching Netflix? No. I, I don't believe that would no. be the case, right? I don't think he would sneak out in the cover of darkness and get in his car to go away to other places to evangelize people. He would probably be talking to people around the pool and knocking on their doors and asking if he could bring them food. This is what I believe evangelism should look like. I believe that we should all have a personal witness to the people who are in our lives. And I know that's uncomfortable for some because it's like, ah, it's not me. It's like, <laughs> you're fortunate that you like it because it is, <laughs> you were made that way. Yes. It, it does come natural for you, but there is a 
it with evangelism there's a per personal witness and then there's a corporate witness too like there are things that we've done right that we go out and we do like our serve last week to spread the love of jesus to people who we wouldn't maybe meet in our own personal lives or we had this corporate witness now which of those is right i mean i believe that both of them is right right we should do it individually but we should also have a corporate expression of what the church looks like i believe is a lumberjacking over there why is he doing i'm about to edit this out I gotta raise my hand right now just because I got distracted by the lumberjack over here. That's why we can't have nice things. So, to evangelize, I believe there should be both things. Again, a couple weeks ago, I was talking about rowing uh, a, a boat or a kayak, and we're only rowing with one arm we're going to do what we're going to spin in circles and i believe that's kind of what the church has been an expression of because the church in some ways i believe when it comes to evangelism well it's like i'll go do those things with a big group of people i'll, I'll be part of that thing that my church does but i'm not going to personally have a conversation about god and my relationship with god and another human being i'm not going to introduce him to god on my own that's just too uncomfortable how many of you guys think Christianity was supposed to be comfortable? <laughs> Carmel is like, no, <laughs> no, it's not. Unfortunately, <laughs> why can't it be about Netflix and Doritos? <laughs> yeah, look, and she got excited. But to evangelize and share the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, with someone else, this is what evangelism is. Personal evangelism should be a lifestyle for every Christian. We should go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. There should be somebody looking to you. If you've been following Jesus for a while, there should be somebody following who? You. If you've been following Jesus for a while, there should be somebody following you as you follow Christ. But before we make disciples, we have to evangelize, right? We have to introduce people to Jesus. So why is evangelism important? I've got a few reasons. I've got five reasons I want to go over this week. Evangelism is first and foremost an act of love. I talked about this just a moment ago. It is that we care about another human being so much that we, we want them to have a relationship with Christ like we do. I'm making shirts. I'm getting shirts done that I made a design for a while back, and it just says love does. Um, because love is an action. And these will probably be the shirts that we start wearing. Uh, a lot of people are growing out of our older blue shirts. Yeah, and, and I'm not going to reprint those. So I've got these new shirts. They say love does. Why? Because love is an action. And evangelism is an action based on love. John uh, 13, 33 through 35 says, My children... I'll be with you only a little while longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now. Where I'm going, you cannot come. A new command I give you is to love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. He said a few times in that, in, in that in a couple of verses, huh? Like it was like in there a few times. We're on the way to church this morning and I was saying things over and over again because I want my kids to understand the parts that I repeated multiple times that I've had multiple conversations with them about multiple times. Did I say multiple? It's been a lot of times. It's been a lot of times. But you and I, we, we have the greatest news in the world and love compels us to share that news with other people. Everyone needs a chance to meet Jesus like we've met Jesus everybody deserves a chance and it's our job it's our role to play that part to show them love do things for them and be compelled by love to introduce them to Christ I know a lot of people get hung up on this it's like oh it's scary to ask somebody if they know Jesus or if they've met Jesus or have that conversation or live that out in front of them but the reality is the opposite is true it's cruel to not offer Jesus Christ to somebody. It would be like having living water, so the Bible says, and not offering it to somebody who's thirsty. 
It would be like having food and not being willing to share food with somebody who is hungry. It would be like having shelter and not sharing shelter with somebody who is cold and wet and in the middle of a storm. Evangelism is not a weird thing to do. It is a loving thing to do. The second thing I want to talk about about evangelism is that evangelism builds our own faith. Carmela's a teacher. Um, I'm sure there are things over the years that you've forgotten, right, Carmela? Like things that you learned and forgot. But when it comes up in a lesson plan, you kind of have to do what? You kind of got to go through it again, right? You've got to learn it. You've got to learn the nuance of the things you're going to be teaching. You've got to learn the details because so you, you can't just wing everything. You can't just wing it. And you think, oh, yeah, I know how to do that. And you're like, oh, I kind of forgot how to do that. When I was uh, getting a job, um, when I was going through the cognitive test portion for the uh, Long Beach and L.A. Longshoremen, they had all these questions. This is like a, this test to do to see if you, you know, had some basic skills. And uh, pa- apparently my basic skills were rusty because I couldn't, we had like four minutes to do 20 long division <laughs> questions. And I could not remember how to divide a multiple number into another multiple number, like a two digit number into a four digit number. And I'm like, I know if I had enough time, I could stare at this and figure it out again, like where the numbers go down in the formula and the equation. But the reality is I didn't have that amount of time. I just didn't have that time. So evangelism, it, when, we, when we learn to evangelize and share our faith, it bolsters our own faith because we have to know what we believe and why we believe those things. It, it helps us learn. It helps us grow. When we make practice of sharing our own faith with those in our lives we strengthen our own core beliefs when we say it over and over again we're like oh yeah that's why i do that i remember that that's why oftentimes i will add our core values in here because these are things that i want us to be about found people find people save people serve people right in teaching you guys i've had to wrestle with a lot of hard questions because there are some things in scripture that you read and you don't know how you fall on it. Like, oh, how, do, how am I to interpret this? What is it? It's, there are things in Christendom, in Christianity, that are interpreted different ways. That's why we have so many denominations. And the reality is that when we are sharing our faith when we're with some other person, we have to come to some type of an understanding of why we believe what we believe from what we've read and what the Holy Spirit has taught us, Right? Am I, am, I, am I right here? Just tell me I'm right. That's all I want to hear. I'm right. All right. Perfect. But in teaching, we have to wrestle with those hard questions. First Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. We have to learn when we're evangelizing because we have to have answers. <laughs> you tell somebody, hey, there's... A God that loves you and you maybe you share with them and you share a life story and then they have a question you don't want to go uh, <laughs> let me get back to you on that one uh, let me get back to you on that so evangelism helps us solidify our own faith and wrestle with those hard questions the third thing I want to talk about is evangelism has eternal benefits Matthew 6 19 and 21 says this do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Here's the reality, guys. We can toil and labor in this life for shiny pieces of plastic and metal and trinkets and experiences that only give us benefit. And when we die, all of those were for nothing. Or we can pour our lives into other people for the kingdom of God. And all of those things that we are involved in then store up treasure for us in the afterlife. So we can do things that benefit us here for 50, 60, 70 years, or we can do things here with the resources that God gave us 
for our life in heaven that's beyond, that lasts forever, where moths and rust do not destroy. I mean, it's good for us. It's actually good here, too. Uh, I, I've talked about this. I realized not too many years ago that I could have gotten on the hamster wheel and chased money and fortune and all of those things. But I've seen so many people that are just miserable that have those things. Like they own them instead of the things own them instead of them owning the things. And because those things no longer satisfy, they have to get more things that will satisfy temporarily. And I realized, and I think this was just wisdom. This was God giving his wisdom to me and saying, Jeremy, you can live your life for the things of this world, or you can live your life for the things that are beyond this world. And I've chosen to do that because I believe it does have eternal benefit. It's not just self-centered to make choices that will ensure us eternal treasure for ourselves. This is about building the kingdom. This is about other people. When we do those things, when we make those decisions for the life beyond, it impacts people in this life and the life beyond. And it's so cool to be able to have conversations with people that are just trying to scheme and figure out how to use what God has given them or where they have influence to impact people's lives in positive ways. There's a friend of mine, I don't know if I've talked about her here at church, her name is uh, Jerry Cole. And uh, when I worked in Arkansas, she was always just, she, we always just had these crazy ideas, right? We're just like, oh, what if we did this? What if we did that? And uh, one day we were talking and just thought, she's like, you know what? You and I are just great at scheming. We're just trying to do whatever we can. Like we could, we could be ugly in this world, scheming and trying to, if it were trying to get stuff for ourselves, but why can't we just turn that and scheme to use the world's riches to grow the kingdom of God and to bless people? And that's what this whole life is about, right? It's about utilizing the ability that we have, the things that God has placed in our life, the resources of people and money and talent and using that to scheme for God so that lives on this earth will be impacted for not just this life, but for eternity. I remember that when she said that I laughed, I'm like, you know what? You have a way of spinning things that uh, I feel really good about my scheming in the moment, you know, like the way that my mind thinks in those different ways. Yeah, let's do some scheming. Yeah, scheming is not always a bad thing. It is a good thing when you do it for the kingdom of God. The fourth thing that I want to talk about is evangelism is a, an overflow of the hope that lies within us. It really is. If you truly have a relationship with God and you believe that God brings hope and brings life, why wouldn't you want to show people? Like, if when my kids find something cool when we're out here in the park, what do they do? They, they run back to all the other kids and they're like, hey, come look, find, come check out this dead raccoon, let's poke it with a stick, right? Like, they think that's cool. Or when they find something, they bury it in this pile over here or whatever they do it's like whenever we find something cool in this life we want to share that with other people there's a evangelism is an overflow of the hope that lies within us it's like when we fall in love with jesus and we're drawn to his word and to worship and services and all of that we want to share that with other people because it brings life to us. I feel energized after I spend time with you guys and hear the stories of what God's doing in your life and how he's working in your life. And even when it's not good news, you and I have a hope that God is going to come through because he said, like we sing about, he's faithful. And we've seen it time and time again. And I can remind you of when God was faithful to me. And you can remind me of when God was faithful to you. And over a period of time, we can have stories of how God has been faithful to us all as a result of putting our eggs in his basket and in his basket alone. If, um, I'll say this as a, just a catch. If you find it easy to go through your life and not want to share Christ and like he's good enough for you, but you don't feel like you should share it with somebody else, that's a spiritual problem in your own life. If you don't want to share this good thing, if you don't want to, like my kids, if they just want to keep everything to themselves that they find that's good, 
we would call that greedy and stingy, would we not? So if we don't want to share this good thing that we found, this life that we found, there's a problem, and that's something that we should work out with our Lord, with God, because it's a spiritual problem. Um, and we got to get to the root of that, because it's not something that God uh, has for us or designed us to be that way. The fifth thing I want to talk about is evangelism. It pleases God. But here's the reality. Jesus isn't looking for blind compliance or allegiance. He doesn't say, do it because I said so. Right? I don't even had a parent that said, do it because I said so. Just do it because... <laughs> wow, I got people pointing at each other. This is a good This is a good morning. Do it because I said so. I've done that before with my kids, and then I look at Janie and wink because I'm like, I know I did that. Yeah, do it. And they ask 92 different ways. And I'm like, do it. Why? Because I said so. But the truth of the matter is this. I don't want my kids to obey me because I told them that they should do it and because they're afraid of the consequences. I want them to obey me because they believe and trust in me that I have good things for them and I'm leading them in the right direction, right? Is that not why? Is that not what we want? And Christ wants the same thing from us. He's not saying do this because I said so and I'll punish you if you don't. He's saying there are good things that lie on that path ahead of you if you'll choose to walk down this path. We hear that word should often, right? We think we should do that, but the reality is it shouldn't be that way for us. It should be out of a heart of love, out of love for our Father and trust that He knows better in our moving forward. It, it does please God when, I mean, have you, we've all raised kids. Most all of us here have raised kids. And when you tell those children to do something and they do it out of the kindness of their heart and the goodness because it's like, it feels so good that they want to please you. Doesn't it? it makes you want to bless them even more, does it not? When they like, what else can I do, dad? That was, that was good. What else can I do? It's like, oh my gosh, instead of, I gotta do this. How come you don't make anybody else do that? And that's oftentimes what I hear. It's just from Janie. Janie does it all the time. <laughs> Why do I got to do the dishes again? And I said, because I said so. And that's why we're still married 20 years later. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. I'm just joking. <laughs> Actually, I did the dishes a few times this week. Wow. Hey, you know what? I make the mess and I clean it up. What are you going to do? <laughs> my stock my stock just went up didn't it first <laughs> uh, corinthians ten thirty one says this so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do do it all for the glory of god we don't do things because god says we have to do them we do them because we believe that he is worthy of the glory that he should receive and we should live our lives in that way I know I used the word should in there, and maybe I should not have used the word should there. But inviting other people into relationship with Jesus is a way of serving God and pleasing him. And in pleasing God, we are the most fulfilled. Um, I have found the most fulfilling life I believe that I can live in just scheming to do good works for people and show people love and spread God's kindness. I found the most fulfilled life I possibly could live. Unless Janie and I had a boat that we could just cruise the ocean and sail on. And that's our retirement plan there. I already found a boat. We're just going to, I'm going to learn how to sail a boat. And we're going to eat fish for breakfast. Ugh. Fish and rice. I don't know. Fish cereal. It'll be good. I know how to cook. But God is good. And we should want to share him, and it pleases the Lord when we do. So there is five things. One, we do it as an act of love. Two, evangelism builds our faith. Three, evangelism has eternal benefits for us and for others. Evangelism is an overflow of the hope that lies within us, and it pleases our Father when we do those things. Why? Because God doesn't want anyone to perish without having the opportunity to have a relationship with him. 
to, with that, to live this life without God, I believe, is a tragedy. And if we love God and we love people, then we will do something to change that outcome. I know evangelism scares people. It's scary for many people. And I think it is scary for many people because they think that they have to know everything about the Bible and go be weird and hand somebody a tract and ask them if they've made the Lord Jesus Christ their personal Lord and Savior. And guys, I'm going to say that's kind of strange. To, to start a conversation with another human being that you don't know that way, it's a strange thing to do. It really is. Like, Jesus didn't even do that. And he was Jesus. I'm going to let that sink in. Amen. It is strange, I believe, to do that. I'm not saying it's wrong. Hey, sometimes it works, but sometimes it does not. I believe that people are caught by showing them love and compassion, by having a genuine interest in who they are as a human being, and by serving them in their time of need. Evangelism seems scary. I know that. But I believe it's because we've been taught to evangelize people to church and not to Jesus. I believe we've taught people to evangelize to church, but not to Jesus. Here's some questions I want us to think about. How should we do evangelism? Number one, I believe we should do evangelism where we have influence already. It doesn't make much sense to me to go out and try to find randos, random people out there when you already have so much influence with the people that are already in your life who kind of know your character, they know what you're about, uh, they know your humor, they've met your family, they know you're not a weirdo or you're a little bit of a weirdo, but you know, that's okay. Now we got more fingers pointing. Boy, it's fantastic this morning. The second question, who knows me? Who's getting to know me? The reality is that God has put people in your life and people who are coming into your life so that you can have some type of influence in their life, right? So that you can speak into their life. So that you can, maybe you don't lead them all the way to Christ, but you lead them one step closer. How many of you guys know it's a journey to making a heart change to follow Jesus Christ? It is. It doesn't happen all at once. And part of the problem, I think, with the church is that we try to make it happen all at once. It's like, hey, turn or burn. You're going to hell if you don't say this prayer with me right now. What? I was just trying to get a soda and enjoy the sunset at the pier. Like, I, I didn't realize that I had to make this life-changing decision right here on the spot just because you met me here and asked me. You know, it's a, it's a journey to Christ. And Christ is okay with that journey. As a matter of fact, when... He called his disciples. They didn't immediately believe everything. He just said, they said, hey, what's going on? He said, come and see. He didn't say, hey, make a decision right now. I'm the Messiah. Bow down and you worship me right now. He said, come and see. And then over time, they got to know him. And over time, they got to see the miracles that he did. They will see the way that he cared for people when others would discard people. So who do you have influence with? Who in your life knows you? Who is getting to know you? Who are you with regularly? Who do you have a lot of influence with because you spend a lot of time with them? These are people who you should probably be evangelizing and trying to and discipling them. Who are people who don't know Jesus that you interact with often? Next week, I want to talk about neighboring because um, I was talking with Joel this week and this has just been something on my mind for a long time. If we... If we were the best neighbors, if Christians were the best neighbors around, if we cared for everybody on our block or at least five or ten people, you know, those families, if we cared for them, brought them presents and gifts and, hey, our extra food, invited them to our parties, and do you think you would have more or less influence in their lives in, in reaching them with the gospel? More, right? The sad thing is, in our culture, everybody has retreated from being a good neighbor. Hardly anybody's a good neighbor anymore. The only thing that people do anymore is tattle on their neighbors because they parked in the red spot for a little too long. Or, you know, they did this, or they put this on their porch, or they painted their house this color and they didn't get a permit for it, or they're building a shed in their backyard, or 
we rat our neighbors out to the city. We call homeowners associations. These are the things that we do because they irritate us. Oh, they park their car on their lawn, on their yard too long, and so on and so forth. But I believe that if Christians were great neighbors, I believe we'd have far more impact on the people who we are around constantly. If we didn't live all of our life inside our homes, if we lived our lives outside and with other people and invited those people into our homes, I believe we'd have far more impact. It's like this. If How many of you guys work in an office space? How many of you guys would say that in your office space or at your place of work, you have more influence with those people than the people that live six houses down? Because you see them regularly, right? I think that has to change. I think we need to learn to be better neighbors. Because the reality is that God has uniquely designed us. I've said this in Psalm 139 says, He knit us together in our mother's womb. God made me the way that I am because he made me the way that I am and needed me to be that way. Same thing is true of you. He didn't need two Jeremy's. He needed you and a Jeremy, right? And that's why he made us that way. But it's not a coincidence that he put us in this geographical place in this geographical time. You live in your neighborhood for a reason. I know that our family lives in our neighborhood for a reason, and we've been able to bless our neighbors and build relationship with our neighbors, and it makes a difference in their lives. It's made a difference in our cul-de-sac. And that's that's as a part, and we haven't even been great at it. It's something I want to be better at. I, want, I was talking with our neighbors across the street. I said, you know what? We should do more to help pull this corner, this, this uh, area together by whenever there's a holiday or something, we should pull our resources together, get an inflatable for the kids and barbecue out in the front yard and just invite, just drop all the neighbors a line and say, hey, you can pop by so we can have conversations so that we can love and serve them. Hey, a movie night in our backyard, the gates open. Come on over, we'll pop some popcorn. We'll, we'll do those things, right? Neighboring. So next week I wanna talk about neighboring. And I think it's so important uh, and, and something I want to start doing, I was talking to Daniel about this a few weeks ago. Um, Daniel, will you hand these out? I printed out some, uh, I printed out some scriptures. Gosh, I didn't even know there were that many. I printed out just one front page of scriptures that has, uh, the word neighbor in it. And you wouldn't believe how many times the scripture talks about neighbors and how we should interact with them and how we should serve them and love them and, you might think, ah, oh, it's just my crazy pastor who is saying, hey, this is some crazy scheme to meet our neighbors. And it's like, nope, it's, it's right there in the Bible. There was probably 10 pages of that, and I only printed out just one. So, yeah. Did you take one or are you giving up on it? I'm kidding. <laughs> um, I'll put these, um, I guess I can put these on a link to them on our Facebook page too for those who aren't here or put it in the YouTube comments. Uh, but the reality is, is I believe the future of the church is to learn how to become and to invade our common spaces again. Um, and I say that not in a crazy way. I think we need to invade our common spaces with love and with service. And I think that'll make a difference in the people's lives who uh, God has placed us in so that we can have an impact and an influence on their lives. So let's pray. Lord Jesus. I know that there are uh, concerns. I know that it can be scary to have a conversation about spiritual things because we kind of live in a post-spiritual world. Um, a lot of people don't talk about spiritual things anymore, and if so, it's kind of kooky. So I pray that uh, we would be people who would learn how to do that and engage people on a spiritual level that isn't weird, it isn't strange, um, and it's not forceful or coercive, but we just present your love to them and let your Holy Spirit do the work as we work through acts of kindness and service and love to our neighbors. I pray for a heart of evangelism. I pray that all of our hearts would break for people who do not know you yet. So much so that we would want to share you with them. We ask these things in your name. Amen.